All right, recording is in progress. Go ahead, Lauren. All right, great. Well, thank you all so much for joining um, for this webinar to learn a little bit more about macroinvertebrates. Um, this is going to be pretty basic. So if you're an angler who already knows a fair bit about um, stream insects, I'm not going to get too much into like the angling side of things and the, the fisherman's language for a lot of these bugs. Um, but I'd, I'd be happy to have a follow up conversation with you if you're if you're interested. Um, as we're going along, if you have questions, feel free to type them into the chat window and we'll address them all at the end. Um, and let's let's just get started. So so thank you all for spending some time with me. Um, this session is really just to talk a little bit about the stream insects that live in our area. Um, and the image on the screen is a stonefly that's actually from Ridley Creek. Um, so there's going to be a lot of images of bugs. So if you have questions about any of them, just let us know. Before I get too far into the biology of it all, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the um, collaborative nature of this project. If any of you were able to attend last Saturday's webinar that spoke um, to the volunteer project taking place in the headwaters of the Darby Creek watershed, you're already familiar with this. Um, but this webinar is part of a series to educate our community about the valuable resources in our backyard. Um, and it's our partnerships with Darby Creek Valley Association and Stroud Water Research Center um, that we're able to make this happen. So I'm the director of the Watershed Protection Program at Willistown, and I'm an aquatic ecologist, which is why I'm talking to you about this today. So what is a macroinvertebrate? It's just an animal without a backbone that's big enough to be seen with your naked eye. And they live all or part of their lives in a water body, which could be a stream or a pond or a lake. And it includes things like gastropods, which are snails, bivalves, which are clams and mussels, crustaceans like crayfish, and any kind of insects, which can be both their adult and larval form. So this insect on the screen um, is actually a larval dragonfly, um, which is pretty crazy, right? It doesn't look at all what we think of a dragonfly to be. Um, but in their larval form, when they live in the stream, dragonflies are apex predators. They are second to none, and they're really important in our food web. So when we're talking about streams and we're, we're talking about making predictions using um, indicator species like bugs, it's important to know where this kind of idea is coming from. Um, and it stems in part from the river continuum concept, which is basically just a prediction model to guess at the proportion of different insects in different niches in our waterways. So as streams get bigger, there's a big change in how the structure exists. So we are in um, the headwaters of Ridley, Crumb, and Darby Creeks. So that's where all of these insects are from. And so that means we're operating up here in the smallest part of the stream. Um, so we would expect to, in a healthy system, to see mostly shredders and collectors, and I'll explain what those are in a little bit, um, and then a smaller proportion of predators and grazers. And as you move further downstream where the river gets bigger, you'd see those proportions start to change. So we're basing a lot of our um, predictions on what our stream health is like based on this um, concept, which actually came out of our partner organization, Stroud's Research Lab. So, I know this map is one of my favorite maps because this is what the United States looks like based on watersheds. So no matter where you are in the world, if you're standing somewhere, you are in a watershed and every action you take in that space, wherever you might be, is going to be directly related to our aquatic health in our waterways. So no matter where you are, um, if you, drop a piece of litter and it washes into a stream, you can predict where that's going to come out in which ocean or bay. So it's important to remember that we are always upstream of someone else and everything that we do on land is reflected in our waterways. So healthy waters start with healthy landscape and we can use our insects to predict how healthy the water is and how well of a job we're doing on the shore or maybe in the middle of the continental United States, how that's impacting our waterways and what we can do to make a better, um, better conditions for all of our wildlife. 
So one of my favorite phrases is trout grow on trees. And you might be thinking like, this is ridiculous. This doesn't make any sense. This is silly. But trout don't physically grow on trees like apples, but rather they rely on all of the input from the, our trees and our shrubs and our things on land to build the food web for them to eat. So fish eat insects, which eat leaves, which come from trees. Um, so this is a really important thing to remember because we're talking about this kind of middle step in our food web. And without our insects, we're not gonna have too many fish. And then where would we be? Very sad, I think, especially if you're an angler. So we have a healthy stream system. It's full of Pennsylvania's beautiful and only native trout, the brook trout. How do we get from leaves to fish? So our oak tree drops some leaves in the fall and they fall into the waterway. But a raw leaf is not particularly delicious. It needs to be conditioned before it can be consumed by any of the other animals in our waterways. So the first thing that happens is a biofilm starts to build up. And a biofilm is just um, algae and diatoms and fungus that start getting to work, breaking down the leaf and making it more delicious and more nutritious for our other insects. So as soon as that leaf is conditioned to be delicious, we start to see our herbivores start moving in to start breaking it down. And our herbivores can be shredders, which break down the, they eat the leaf itself, or scrapers who tend to scrape the biofilm off of the leaf. And it's important to, to know that as the carbon starts to be transformed in our waterways um, from a leaf to an insect to a fish to maybe an osprey, um, so do the, the different larvae in, in our waterways. So um, this is a stonefly. And in this image, the stonefly is a shredder, and which is true when it's young. But as it starts to get bitter, bigger, it becomes a predator. So there's lots of changes that happen at all different stages in, in our stream and how everyone lives there. So we have our very messy eaters. There's always lots of things floating around in our stream. And so we have a lot of collectors who don't necessarily break down the food themselves, but instead capture it as it's flowing downstream to consume it. Um, so this is a caddisfly, and caddisflies are fantastic because they are considered, um, in many streams, a keystone species. So you can see this organism has this really cool case made out of stones, and caddisflies are in the, um, are the order Trichoptera, which are related very closely to butterflies and moths in the family, or order Lepidoptera. And so much like butterflies and moths will build a silk cocoon, um, caddisflies use a very similar silk to build these cases. And some of them don't build cases, but rather um, this funnel that captures the food and they live at the end so they can just go basically to the kitchen to grab a snack. Um, so there's a lot of variation and really interesting adaptations that all of these stream insects have to exploit the different niches in the waterways. And of course, where you have herbivores, you've got predators. So this is our friend, the dragonfly, who is the apex predator. Um, and dragonflies come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes. Um, and they are second to none in consuming um, herbivores in the aquatic system. And they're only second to one in being predators once they emerge and become like the traditional, what we think of as a dragonfly. And the only um, organism that's more effective with a higher stri strike rate than a dragonfly is a small um, seahorse, actually, which is kind of funny. You don't think about seahorses as being apex predators, but there you go. You also have predators that maybe you haven't seen before. This is a helgramite, and when it um, turns into its adult form, they're called dobson flies and fish flies. Um, and this is one of the first organisms that starts to disappear as water quality starts to decrease. So why do we study these insects? Um, it's really important to be able to look at the biological components in our stream because they live there all year long. Um, so typically we would pair biological study like macroinvertebrates with chemistry. Um, 
it's important to have them together because chemistry is a lot faster um, to analyze, but because we're going out and we're taking a stream sample out of the stream, we're taking the water away from the stream, which is constantly changing and dynamic, we're only capturing data points for that one millisecond in time. But being able to look at all of the different insects that can live for over a year in the stream system, it gives us a much larger window of time to get a better understanding of how the waterways are constantly changing. So if we're seeing an insect like this stonefly, um, who's very large and about to turn into its adult form, that's a good indication that for the last 18 months, this insect has been healthy and thriving um, in high quality conditions. So all of these organisms exist on a spectrum of sensitivities. So the group one are very intolerant to pollution. As soon as you um, start seeing a lot of caddisflies and mayflies and stoneflies and maybe even some helgramites, these Dobson fly larvae, it's a good sign that you have a healthy, a healthy and diverse um, ecosystem in your waterway. If you aren't seeing many of those insects, but you're seeing more of this group too, it's a good sign that something might have happened and all of those sensitive insects couldn't live there anymore. Um, and so you're left with these more um, hardy insects that can take changes in temperature and dissolved oxygen. If you run into a system where your sample only has these group three and group four really, really tough insects that can withstand a lot of changes, that's a really good indication that something horrible has happened and you've lost a lot of your sensitive insect. And when I say something horrible, it could be something like the stream dried up because there was a drought, or it could be that there was a chemical spill or that temperatures just got too hot for too long and all of the insects in your um, sensitive groups have disappeared. So we really wanna look at these, the big three, the mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies, or ephemeroptera, plecoptera, and trichoptera. And these are our highly sensitive indicator species. And we look at these because they're the first really to change in their um, population densities when there is a problem. So I wanna give you some really quick um, tools to be able to identify these in case you feel inspired after this and you wanna go out in your stream and start turning over rocks to see what's there. So mayflies, um, it's easy to identify them because usually they'll have three big tails on their back end. So these caudal filaments um, usually come in groups of three, but not always. Sometimes this middle tail can be vestigial, which means it's shrunken up and barely visible. So it looks like they just have two tails. Um, and that's important to remember that sometimes two or three for mayflies. If, they're, um, if you're not sure and there's only two tails and you don't wanna get it confused with someone else, you can look to see if there are gills on the abdomen. Um, mayflies always have abdominal gills. And you can also, if you have a microscope, or a hand lens, you can look at the end of their feet and see if you can find one claw at the end of their legs. Those three things, if you find them all, means this is a mayfly in its larval form. But, so not all mayflies look like this. This is a flat-headed mayfly. Um, when it emerges, it looks like this. So it goes through a pretty big transformation um, as it goes into its adult form. And the easiest way to identify mayflies in their adult form is they hold their wings up high um, and they always keep them packed up on their back. So you can see that there are only two tails on this adult mayfly um, and it's got its wings up high. So mayflies can be very big or very small um, and it all, it all depends on the species. There's a lot of diversity. Um, you know, and they can be very, very different looking when they're larva. This guy's a burrower, so he's got these big antlers on the front to help dig a hole. But look at these beautiful, fluffy, feather-like filamentous gills and two, three nice big tails. So they're really, really interesting to look at. And every organism is perfectly adapted to live um, exactly where it lives in our waterways. So hexagenia, which is what we were just looking at, um, turns into a very large adult 
um, mayfly. And this is a really popular hatch for fly fishermen. Um, they make great lures. I mean, even in the streams around here, this, um, this is a mayfly from Crumb Creek. You can see this one is a collector. He's got these nice big frills on his front arms and he uses them to catch food as it flows by. He just catches it and has a snack. Um, so these, you know, there's a lot of really beautiful um, and clever adaptations that you can really um, learn a lot of lessons from with each of these insects. So remember I said it was important to remember that mayflies can have two or three tails. Stoneflies only ever have two. Two tails right on the back end and they don't ever have their gills on their abdomen. They're variable where you might find the gills. Sometimes they're in the, um, a stonefly's armpits and sensitive species, if you have them in a container, if they start getting stressed out, they do push-ups so they can get more water flowing over their gills. Um, and they always have two claws, two claws, tails, that's a stonefly. Um, and stoneflies are, I think, some of the most beautiful macroinvertebrates Many are boldly patterned, some are not, um, and they can get to be very large and they tell us a lot about what's happening in our waterways. So this is an adult stonefly. Adult stoneflies hold their wings flat on their, ba on their back. Um, you can see it has its two caudal filaments too. Um, and you might be seeing, if you live near a waterway, some of these guys starting to pop up right around now. There are a couple of hatches taking place. And then my personal favorite are the caddisflies. So the best way to identify a caddisfly is, is it in a house? Um, does it build a case? Not all of them do. Um, so if you find a caddisfly or what you think is a caddisfly without a case, you can look and see if it has a hook on its back end. And that hook helps it to stay in place during high flow periods. Um, if you want to learn more and see more high quality pictures of these insects, I really would encourage you to go to macroinvertebrates.org. This is a fantastic website that um, has a lot of high quality pictures of these insects, um, as well as each of these little markers tells you how to identify them um, and what you should look for in order to see the order or family. Um, so it's a really cool um, learning website, and if you're just curious, there are some fantastic adaptations and really good images of how these um, insects have adapted to live in our streams. So this looks like a moth, and that's because uh, Lepidoptera and Trichoptera, caddisflies and butterflies, are closely related. So like a butterfly, it has scales on its wings, and it holds its wings kind of in a triangle shape on its back. Um, they're there are loads of caddisfly adults starting to pop up right now um, with little black wings. You should see them in almost every um, stream system and riparian area in our region right now. So each of these insects tells a really important story. The um, mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies act like a canary in the coal mine. So it's well understood what their relationship to water quality is. Um, and if you're starting to see them disappear, it's an early warning that there are changes happening in your ecosystem that might not be for the best. So how do we um, take just the presence or absence of these insects and turn it into data points that we can use to make recommendations? So the best way, um, my favorite way is using the MOSS score. Um, so MOSS stands for the Macroinvertebrate Aggregated Index for Streams, and basically it compiles 10 different statistical analyses, everything from um, the number of mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies, all the way down to um, looking at the percent of insects who are scrapers. And it compiles all this data and gives you a number. And if it's above about a 13, that means you've got a healthy, healthy waterway. All your canaries are there and they're singing and it's great. Um, if it falls below a 13, that means you, you're starting to see some loss and you have an impacted system. Um, and maybe you should start looking into possible things that are negatively impacting um, the water quality in that region. If you have below a six, you are facing about 90% loss of your biodiversity and changes need to be implemented to start improving that waterway um, and to improve the water quality, both for the insects 
and um, other organisms that live in the stream, but also if it's a, a source of water for people, that needs to be improved also. So how do we get this data? There's a lot of different ways to get insects out of a stream. Um, for our efforts, we use a server sampler, which is basically a, a square that you sit into um, the stream bank and water flows. And as you agitate and scrub the rocks in this little metal um, marker area, it flows into your net. And then you can take that sample, put it in ethanol, and identify everybody under a microscope. Similarly, you can use a D-frame net, which one person can use. Um, you, similar to the server sampler, you agitate upstream of your net and all of the insects will panic and let go and then flow into the net to be analyzed later. And the kick net is very similar. Each uh, different protocols will call for different sample collection methods. Um, so it's always good to know that there's a variety of different ways that you can go out and do this work. If you're just curious and you don't have one of these nets, you can always go out and pick up rocks um, in riffle areas, which is where the water is bubbling over um, in a shallow zone, bubbling over rocks. Um, lift the rocks up and look and see if you can see any creepy crawlies on there. And if you have um, really good eyes, you might be able to identify it on the rock. Um, or you could bring out a hand lens and start to see what's there. So this is my team um, last year going out and collecting with a server sampler. Um, so you can see we've got scrub brushes to get some of those. These insects are adapted to hold on during um, turbulent times in the stream. So sometimes they won't let go right away. So you just bring a scrub brush and gently, gently brush them off and they'll flow in and then you can identify them. So if I were an insect, I would like to live in this stream. It looks really nice, right? I'd hang a hammock here. Um, but what makes it nice? So looking down our stream, we see we've got big trees that are shading the stream, which means on a hot summer day, this water is going to stay cool. The banks are really gently sloped, so there's not any signs of really bad erosion or anything like that. And if you look, you can see that there are rocks of different sizes um, and some algal growth and some emergent aquatic plants in here all of which are signs of a healthy waterway. If I were a bug, I would not want to live there. Um, this stream is degraded. And this picture is after a flood event. Um, but you can see there's not a lot of trees or plants on this side of the bank. Um, this is a really wide channel. It's very straight. Um, and it's, I can tell you that this channel is normally fairly deep. So, on a summer day, the sun beats down on this water and it gets really warm. And warm water doesn't hold a lot of oxygen. So for some of our sensitive insects, this would be a really bad place for them to live because they need high levels of oxygen to survive. Um, so I would expect if we went and did some sampling here, we would not find a lot of sensitive insects, but we'd see a lot of those really hardy guys um, that can withstand a lot of abuse before disappearing from the stream system. So when we are sampling at sites like this, we're taking notes on what the shores look like, um, what the water quality looks like after it rains, um, because we want to keep in the back of our minds um, different methods that we can get to get it to look like this again. So it's higher quality water, um, full of a very diverse set of insects who are thriving. Um, because if you have a lot of insects, you're gonna have more fish. And if you have more fish, it's a good sign that your water quality is is better than a barren wasteland. So I hope that this really brief talk has inspired you a little bit to go into your stream systems and start peeking around, looking at all of these ancient insects, um, because all of our aquatic macroinvertebrates are really, really old. They're some of the oldest terrestrial species. Um, they crawled out of the water sometime in the Devonian period, out of um, you know the prehistoric oceans and colonized on land, and for the most part have adapted and then remained unchanged. So there are records of dragonflies from, from millions and millions of years ago who had wingspans of two feet wide, and they've shrunk a lot, thankfully, um, but still there, it's really, I think, humbling to be able to go out and see these living fossils. 
and know that they have stories to tell us and um, lessons to teach us about our waterways and how we can be better stewards of our landscape um, as they have seen everything. And they're so robust with some, um, in some waterways, the only thing to have ever removed the stream insects was glaciation and they always return. So it's good to, good to keep that in the back of our minds while we're doing research and seeing degraded and unhealthy streams that you know, with proper care and a lot of time, we can restore all of these waterways back into healthy ecosystems. So I hope you enjoyed this talk. I know it was very brief and um, you know, only touched loosely on some of the some of the stream insects because there are dozens and dozens and dozens to learn about. Um, but if you have questions, let me know. Um, I'm always happy to talk about bugs. And if you want to learn more about the volunteer work that we're hoping to be able to do soon when we're allowed to come out of quarantine, um, we're having these Thursday webinar series. Next Thursday, Dave Bressler um, is going to be talking about Monitor My Watershed and digital tools that you can use to get to know your waterway better. And the following week, I'll be back here and talking about um, salt and chlorides in our waterways and how we can monitor them to see how we're doing, if, if you know, where we can make improvements and how we can improve our, the health of our ecosystems. So if you're interested in becoming a volunteer, contact Sue Miller of Darby Creek Watershed or Darby Creek Valley Association. Um, and my email address is at the bottom. So if you have follow-up questions that um, you know, pop up later or you find something interesting and you want to see if I know anything else about it, feel free to shoot me an email. I'm always happy to answer questions. And as all of my colleagues will tell you, I, I will talk about insects all day long. They're, one of my absolute favorite things. So with that, I'd really like to say thank you. And then it looks like we've had some chats popping up. So I'd love to have some discussions. Yeah.